we are talking about a very special and very unusual topic today. Today, we're going to be talking about the spiritual roots of anti-Semitism. Now, we don't tend to think of the anti-Semitism as having spiritual roots, because when we think of spirituality, we tend to think of good things. But the underlay, what undergirds everything in creation, is always rooted in something in the spiritual world. So we're going to do our best to delve into it a little bit today. Uh, if you'd like, if you're excited about that and you want to get on with it, please give us a like and a share. Spread Torah to everyone around you, and um, let's take it away. So one question that is kind of advanced through all uh, generations is why do they hate the Jews? It's interesting because it's almost as if the, the, the anti-Semites and whoever the anti-Semites are at any given time, it's almost as if they treat it as if the Jews have just come on the scene. They just appeared out of thin air. And we have to think, well, are the Jews good for society? Are they not good for society? Uh, is this a, are they a good thing? Are they not a good thing? And as if we haven't been here since at least 3,300 years ago, uh, we, it's treated sometimes as if it's like this newfound thing that we have to figure out how to deal with. And anti-Semitism has taken a variety of forms, uh, from any, anywhere from Pharaoh to Haman to Hitler, anti-Semitism has, has been shaped and been branded in a variety of ways over the generations. And I'd like to go, get into a little bit of the details of how that goes uh, in our session today. So the Jews have been blamed historically for just about anything. Right? Pick a thing and the Jews have been blamed for it. Or at least the reason for anti-Semitism has been attributed by the anti-Semites to some sort of superficial thing. So for example, in, in Germany, uh, in Nazi Germany, but very, very much in uh, recent memory, relatively speaking, the, the, the antagonism, the, at least the superficial coding of it, was that the Jews were connected with communism. And so since the, 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 German, the, the Nazi party was, uh, was not communist, it was, it was to the right of communism, they hated the Jews because the Jews were the communists. Now, uh, ironically, in Soviet Russia, they hated the Jews. Why? Because the Jews were the capitalists. And, and this was always the superficial sort of um, branding, uh, the superficial viewpoint as to why the anti-Semites of any given era hated the Jews of that particular time. So uh, we find also the theme, the spirit of the anti-Semitism taking different trends throughout the ages. So for example, um, pre-enlightenment, when religion was really in vogue, so that the main, the main accusations that came against the Jews since the time of, of the temp, since temple times all the way through the Middle Ages and the Renaissance usually were theologically based. It was usually one religious group not liking the Jews on theological grounds. Okay, and so after that trend uh, went by the wayside and religion was no longer sort of the uh, the guiding force in society, and it became uh, more in the lines of uh, of of, uh, of science. So the 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 antagonism against the Jews took on scientific form uh, or pseudo scientific form that the Jews were somehow inferior in in a variety of ways and trying to prove it from a scientific vantage point, either that their features weren't weren't proper or whatever the case may be. Now, after science also be, uh, lost its sense of vogue, it wasn't the guiding force in society, and the guiding force in society became things more in line with uh, civil rights and ethics and, in that regard. And so the, 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 the Jews had to be hated, or, and currently are hated, uh, oftentimes, or the, at least the guys, again, this is all just the guys, the guys that it comes under, is is uh, in in the realm of civil rights so they'll take the state of israel and they'll attribute that as representing the jews or judaism 
uh, that's in people's minds. That's what that's what the state represents. And then they'll say that Israel is in violation of human rights and uh, whatever whatever a, vari a variety of different human rights issues. And so anti-Semitism throughout the ages has taken on the theme, the guise, and been the uh, we've been the scapegoat of whatever is in vogue in society at that time. In fact, there was recently a, a study or a, a survey that was taken in, in London, I believe, where 20% of the participants believed that the Jewish people were somehow behind the coronavirus. So you, whatever, is the, whatever is in vogue, whatever people are talking about, whatever uh, the guiding force in society is at any given time, the Jews are somehow always find themselves at the front of the of the antagonism based on whatever is trending in society. So uh, w it, the the forms and the and the manifestations uh, of anti-Semitism is kind of like a virus. It's a virus that's taken on. It's mutated into various forms throughout the centuries. So the question is, right? Or Forget the question, first of all. Let's, let's take one fact. Okay, the one fact is that the Jewish people's survival during the 2000 year exile, since the temple was destroyed, despite being constantly tossed around from place to place while facing anti-Semitism and persecutions, has been nothing short of miraculous. In fact, Rabbi Yaakov Emden uh, wonderf wonderfully uh, puts it in his commentary on the Siddur, on the prayer book. He says that if a person wants evidence, uh, or at least a, a glimmer of evidence, that there's a God in the world, the Jewish people's survival for the past 2,000 years, despite all of the constant antagonism and pogroms and inquisitions and crusades and everything against them, is attests to the fact that there's something going on here, there's something divine that keeps this people alive. And so uh, another thing that's not short of miraculous in a, in a negative sense is the fact that the Jews have in fact constantly been tossed out and persecuted. What is it about the Jews? Why do they hate the Jews? In fact, if, if, and if somebody looks at the Jewish people merely as a people among peoples and applies the, the common rules and reasons for hate and persecution that you ordinarily uh, would find uh, at the, at the, in the viewpoint of, of hate groups and of, of uh, the hating mentality, one of the things that you would find, you would never find a satisfactory explanation for anti-Semitism. You, you can't, uh, and this is why, all of the attempts at trying to pinpoint uh, where anti-Semitism comes from and uh, how to prevent anti-Semitism all kind of come up, uh, they don't really come to any sort of conclusion. And so if we, but if we look at Klal Yisrael, if we look at the Jewish nation, not as a nation amongst nations that, it, that just like the French people uh, have France and the English people have England, and each each people has its sort of representative country and is is a nation based on their language and their culture and everything like that. If we if we if we look at if we look at the Jews in the same way, you won't find a reason for anti-Semitism. But if we look at the Jewish nation in the way in which the Torah describes the Jewish nation as a nation apart, right, as the Am Segula. Then, then things become a little bit more clear. It becomes more clarity in, in the given situation. So, for our purposes, let's divide anti-Semitism into into two different types. Okay. So, the first type we'll say is the type of anti-Semitism that is is typical: the the stereotyping, the prejudice type of behavior. The idea that the Jews are dirty or weak or immoral or that they're in some way, shape or form uh, in inferior to their surrounding, the surrounding nations. So that's that's number one level anti-Semitism. And then number two level anti-Semitism is uh, th that's the persecutions. Now, someone might think that the Jews are inferior or they may hate them, but that doesn't yet mean 
that they're going to persecute them. That doesn't yet mean that they're going to do something that's bad, right? In fact, I might think, you might think, you may have people in your life that you think are immoral, that you might think are bad people, people that you don't really want to associate yourself with, but you don't have any any plans to you know, to go do anything bad to them. You don't have any uh, you don't have any plans that that you're going to. Uh, persecute them that you're going to send pogroms and whatever so the two le the, there's two there's two levels of anti-semitism that it's worth addressing for our purposes again number one is the typical just the hatred the stereotypes the whatever the case may be and the second is the actual persecutions where that where that hatred that inner hatred those feelings of animosity actually are translated into action, persecution against the Jews, two different levels. Now, both of these forms of anti-Semitism are kind of difficult to explain from a scientific and a natural perspective, especially the expulsions and the annihilations of the, of the Jewish people, which oftentimes will even contravene the anti-Semites' own interests. So take Nazi Germany, for example. Nazi Germany, it's in recent memory. Rabbi Wigzer Miller points out uh, a very uh, interesting and ironic part of Nazi hatred against the Jews. Rabbi, Rabbi Miller says that it was especially remarkable, the anti-Semitism in Nazi Germany, in view of the tremendous disadvantages and losses that the Germans willingly undertook in order to still their bloodlust. In other words, they lost out. They, in, in their own seeking of the Jews' destruction, they lost out on certain things for themselves. So the Jews, the, the Jews comprised a, a very uh, valuable part of the German economy. Uh, and the slave labor of Polish Jewry could have kept Germany, Germany's arm, uh, armament industry humming. It, it could have... Um, it could have saved the Nazis from, from the, the public opinion, the bad public opinion of foreign countries that were coming about from, from, from the, uh, their persecution of the Jews. Right? Instead of annihilating these people, at least for the wartime, use them strictly as slave labor. Again, if, if from a logical perspective, it's still a terrible thing, but from a logical perspective, it's like, okay, well, we hate these people, and therefore, since there's a war going on, we're going to use them for slave labor. Okay, again, that's terrible, but that would be a logical thing for an anti-Semite to do, an anti-Semitic nation. But they didn't do that. That wasn't, the, that wasn't the case. Yet the Nazis took the trains, which were so vitally needed for troop transportation and war materials, and they diverted those trains, those very trains and those railways, for the senseless transportation of Jews to killing centers. In other words, the way that they behaved was completely illogical. It wasn't only evil, and it wasn't only against the Jews, it was completely illogical in every way. So anti-Semitism can come in the form of, 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 of ways where it, it's not even logical. The, the, not only is the hatred not logical, because hatred is not typically a logical thing, but the, the anti-Semites themselves are losing on the situation. They could have used the slave labor, they could have used the trains to transport uh, their war materials, but instead they used those same trains to transport Jews just for senseless killing. And in addition, a second front, a second war front against Russia was suicidal. And the sole achievement of pursuing a Russian front was for the killing of Jews, in order to kill and murder as many Russian Jews as possible. So th this was a, a, a stunning, stunningly terrible miracle, meaning miracle in the sense that it's beyond logic, beyond nature, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. The, the death trains were packed with Jewish scientists, with medical specialists, with industrialists, with, with armies of free labor that were taken away from German factories. Factories closed down. The trains were being tied up for murder transports. It's an unbelievably illogical and nonsensical plan. 
it's got the the concept of anti-Semitic, and this is this is in its most uh, modern and and stunning uh, sort of sort of manifestation. But oftentimes, countries will persecute Jews. Anti-Semites will persecute Jews at the at their own uh, taking a loss for themselves. And so. And this was after the Jews had lived in Germany for many years as, as good citizens and tranquilly and in peace with their German neighbors. They were loyal and dedicated German citizens, many of them. And so the first question is, what causes anti-Semitic hatred? And a much more bizarre phenomenon, anti-Semitic persecutions and murder. Where does all of this stem from? Where does it come from? And so the question gets even more bizarre, right? A, a, another question that we could add to this, this uh, the ensemble of questions that we have over here, is how does an anti-Semite, how does an anti-Semite define a Jew to begin with? In other words, let's say an anti-Semite decides that he hates Jews, okay? He, he hates Jews and that's, that's it. He just doesn't like the Jews. Now, in his mind, who is a Jewish person that should be hated? Who is this person called a Jew that should be hated? Right? What characteristics does this Jew in his mind have that would identify, that would, right, would, be, would, would be a way to quantify or identify the object of his hate? So, of course, if you're a, a, you know, if you're a religious Jew and you look like a Jew on the outside, and you dress a certain way and you walk a certain way and talk a certain way, okay, fine, that's an identifiable Jew. Fine. Okay, I get you hate that you hate that type of people, those people. But a, sim, a, a Jew who ex externally isn't overtly Jewish, someone who is engaged, in, who has, who is assimilating, who, who on, on the outside doesn't actively engage in in the in in, in a Jewish any sort of Jewish worldview and any sort of Jewish. Uh, religious tradition or culture, anything like that. So an, a, a Jew who has assimilated, who, whose Jewishness is not discernible in any way, shape, or form, why does the anti-Semite consider him a Jew altogether? Right, so you have two citizens that are standing on the street corner, right? Both are dressed in the same, you know, the same, they, they wear the same type of clothing, they talk the same way, they walk the same way, they're both cultured, educated atheists. Neither one of them keeps kosher. Neither one of them keeps Shabbat, right? One is a Jew. One is Lahavdil. One is a, one is a non-Jewish person. What does the anti-Semite hate about this Jew? He doesn't look like a Jew, quote unquote. He doesn't act like a Jew. What is it that the anti-Semite hates? So, from a Torah worldview, we can define we can define a Jew that a Jew is someone born. Uh, of a Jewish mother, or someone who uh, converts properly and goes under the proper conversion uh, process. That's a Jew, fine. That, that's, that's the way that the Torah and, and our collective Torah tradition define Judaism and, or being of Jewishness. But the anti-Semite who's not using that as their lens, what is, what is it out there? What, what could you define as a Jew that you hate? Right? The, it doesn't make any sense. Right? The, the anti-Semite will hate the one, the two guys that are standing on the street corner, the anti-Semite will hate the one that's the Jew, even though in all external ways, they're exactly the same. Imagine, for example, someone, right, someone was uh, persecuting a Buddhist, right? Even though the person doesn't practice Buddhism, right? The guy would say, well, what makes me a Buddhist? Right? It would, what do I have in common with the Buddhists that, that, that you're persecuting? That what, what, what's, what's, my, what's my relationship with them? I don't believe in, in Buddhism. I don't, I don't practice any of their principles. Why are you persecuting me? Right? And so, too, we can ask that of the, of the anti-Semites. What are the common characteristics of Jews that makes them, in their eyes, Jews? What is it that you're hating? What's the common denominator that would unite a Chinese convert, a Ger Hasid, right, with long, with a big strimal and, and long payas, uh, with a, and a Yemenite Baba, and a, an assimilated uh, German atheist, 
uh, from, from any time. What, in any observable way, how, how do they share any sort of ca common characteristics? They don't believe the same way. Uh, they don't look the same way. Culturally, they're very different. What, what is going on over here? What, and in every observable way, they, 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 are, they, are, they are completely unrelated. Why are they the ire of the anti-Semite? All equally. What is it about the Jew? How do you even know who to hate? So, responding to anti-Semitism using the same methodologies that are used for, for other uh, intergroup hatred it won't succeed. It's like you're trying to respond to a toothache with a, with a jackhammer, right? It's the wrong tool. Right? You, you got to use, use one tool for one purpose and one tool for another purpose. You can't use the same tools uh, and expect the same results. So the Jewish people, in the way that the Torah defined them, are said to, they're not counted amongst the nations. It's not like, okay, we're just one of, one of, one of the nations. And, 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 and I don't mean this in a, in a sort of better or worse type of way. But the Jew, what, what I mean is that the Jewish nation is considered something different. Right? And that, and that is that is something that, um, you know, certain things would work for us, some things wouldn't work for us. And so, measuring uh, how how to gauge and how to remedy anti-Semitism in the same way that we would do so with other uh, hate groups and hate ideologies, it wouldn't work in the same way. Now, all that there have been plans, there have been situations throughout the generations. Uh, people had misguided. Uh, ideas as to how to end anti-Semitism. And the truth is that the, the ideas about how to end anti-Semitism really took two essential forms. The first form that people came up with, you know, it's, uh, these, are, these, are not, these are not appropriate, these are not good, but these are what has been tried over the years. One way is to try to uh, change the Jews, right? If you change the Jews, then they're, they're not going to be persecuted anymore. They're not going to hate us if we, change, if we are changed. And the second is to try to get the anti-Semites to change so they don't persecute the Jews anymore. All right, the, what, one of the two, either the Jews should change or the anti-Semites should change. Now, the idea that the Jews changing themselves can, uh, can remedy anti-Semitism assumes that there's something about the Jew that evokes anti-Semitic hatred. Once we can identify that something in, in this warped mentality, once we can identify that something that they hate by eliminating it, the theory goes that we can eliminate anti-Semitism. So examples of how that has been uh, different groups and ideologies that have come up over, over history uh, of, of uh, groups that had this sort of idea that if we just change certain aspects of the Jewish people, of Judaism, or, or whatnot, that the anti-Semites will stop hating us. And so this was this was big among this was a big idea amongst the Maskilim, the the Enlightenment movement, uh, uh, assimilationists, uh, even the early Zionists. The, the idea was we change Judaism, or, or we change the Jews, right, and and give a different you know rebrand ourselves, and the anti-Semites will stop hating us. Now, again, we're not saying that these movements were born out of the idea that, um, you know, specifically for the purpose of ending anti-Semitism, but each one of them thought that they believed that the benefits that they would reap, one of the benefits that they would reap, would be the elimination of anti-Semitism. And time and again, right, through trying all sorts of various methods, it didn't work. Assimilation didn't work because the Jew haters still hated and the Jew persecutors still persecuted even amongst even the assimilated Jews. In fact, right, the opposite of what you might have expected happened, right? There was a more tremendous backlash, a violent anti-Semitism that erupted in response to Jewish attempts at assimilation. Uh, with regard to the, the many of the Jews that had lived in Germany prior to the Second World War, and again, I want to make a disclaimer, I'm not in any way, shape, or form suggesting that the, that, that 
that the Holocaust or anything that happened there was a direct punishment for a specific sin or a group of specific sins. I'm not suggesting that in any, in any, any terms. What I'm saying, though, is that there was a large segment of the Jewish community that was living in Germany that were completely secular, that they, as far as their uh, active, open expression of Judaism, many of them were atheists, and many of them even identified that Germany was sort of the new homeland of the Jews, that Berlin was the new Jerusalem, that they finally found their home, they finally found a place where they can call comfortable. And we see that despite assimilating on, on, on every level, that on every external level, Despite that fact, the that didn't that didn't uh, quench the bloodlust of the anti-Semites. They were Jews nonetheless, even though every external feature would suggest that they are just regular German atheists or or what or whatnot, cultured German people. Everything on the everything externally, but the that did not that did not get rid of anti-Semitism. That did not say, well, the, the anti-Semites didn't say, well, now that the Jews are more like us, or now that they're acting like us, or they're participating, believing, and culturally, everything like us, we stop hating them now. No, it not only continued, but it continued with even a greater zeal. The Holocaust is one of the most uh, terrible uh, encounters between anti-Semites and Jews. And it's particularly peculiar because they didn't, it wasn't just that they were after the Jews who were religious or the openly Jewish or looked Jewish or whatever it was. It was anyone who bore the name Jew upon them, even those who had just Jewish family members. They were so disgusted by the concept of the Jew that they had to eradicate their entire nation, uh, or they sought to eradicate their entire nation of this of this virus that was the Jews. There's so the principle of where anti-Semitism comes from makes no logical sense. You can't point to a Jew. You wouldn't if you didn't know that someone was Jewish. Oftentimes, you can't point to them. You can't, there's not specific features that you can. Now, all sorts of, all hatred is bad. Hatred of another person based on the way they look or based on other features or, or their, their uh, lifestyle. But hatred is not a good thing, okay? However, there is a logical sort of hatred. And when I say logical, I don't mean that it's good. I mean, it's, you can identify the object of your hatred. If I don't like a certain race, okay, the way that I the way that I can identify the person that I hate is by finding someone of that race. And I hate that person, I can point to that person. But the Jews are, again, like we mentioned before, the Chinese convert and the Yemenite Baba and the Ger Hassan with the big strimal and the long payas and the the assimilated cultural Jew, or not even cultural Jew, all look very different, all believe very different, act very different, everything. So what is it about Jew, the Jew that is so despised? And so the, the object of what we're getting to is that anti-Semitism has spiritual roots. And it's not, it's not based on something in the realm of logic. It's not based on something uh, sort of superficial that you can point and identify and say, that's what they hate about the Jew. It has nothing to do with something that can be pointed at. It's a spiritual principle. And th this is a principle that's brought down by the Beis HaLevi, among others. Uh, and the principle is, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an idea that we say in Havdalah every week. In Havdalah, we, see, we teach that Hashem created right, a separation between day and night, between the Jewish people and the nations, uh, between and the, and these these separations are are are, uh, are parallel in the sense that the way that day and night interact with each other is the way in which the the uh, the embedded formula, spiritual underlying formula that exists between the Jewish the, the Jewish nation and the nations of the world uh, is. In the sense that 
when, in the same way that when day and night are transitioning into one another, uh, at, when it's when it becomes as it becomes more nighttime, as it becomes more dark outside, right? It, it ceases to be day. the the automatic The automatic um, the automatic effect is that it, 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 as as nighttime um, comes, the daytime leaves. It's it's a it's a it's a give and take relationship, and vice versa. When the daytime comes, the nighttime leaves. Right? As the sun comes up, the darkness in the in the night kind of goes away as as the as the daytime uh, comes and so they they are meant to be uh, a degree there's meant to be a degree of separation now the the existence amongst the jews and the nations we we are not at all teaching that the the jews and the nations of the world are not supposed to get along together they are supposed to get along together in fact any any teaching that we have in our Torah tradition always says that we're not meant to go in the practices of the nations of the world. In other words, we're not supposed to uh, subvert our Torah values and our Torah perspective for uh, secular uh, perspectives and culture. Yet at the same time, we're meant to be friends uh, with our neighbors. We're meant to be, in fact, a light to the nations of the world, an example as to what the, what divine service in in this world is all about, and by doing so, we're we're achieving not only our purpose as the Jewish nation, but we're helping the nations of the world to achieve their purpose. Our our, our faith does not promote the active conversion of people, seeking uh, to bring bring everyone from bring everyone uh, from from a non-Jewish faith or background into the Jewish faith. At the same time, though, we do very much promote the idea that everyone, no matter what their background is, should be connected with the Torah, should serve Hashem, should serve God, uh, and, and do the commandments that are relevant to them. And this is how we work together. The Jewish people and the nations of the world are, are meant to work together to make this world into a dwelling place for Hashem, a dwelling place for God. And what happens, what, what the Torah and the Torah's prohibitions against mixing with the nations of the world has much more to do with the preservation of our Torah mindset, of our Torah worldview. And, and so if, if the Jews are, if you're friendly with your neighbor and you're Jewish and, and your neighbor is not Jewish and, and, and you are you're trying to serve Hashem together, you're trying to do good in the world together, you enjoy each other's company, all of the things that friendship maintains, and your Torah, but your Torah mentality and your Torah existence, your Torah worldview is preserved, this is a wonderful thing. In fact, you will very often be an inspiration for your non-Jewish friend. However, if your Jewish, if your, your participation in the Torah and your involvement in Torah and your enthusiasm in the Torah worldview begins to get diminished because you're trying to blend in and become uh, of the nations of the world, meaning adapting a secular mindset, adapting a mindset that is outside the scope of Torah tradition, that's when the problems come about. And so this teaching of the Beis Alevi is that there always has to be this type of separation between the Torah ideology and the secular or, or ideologies of the other nations that we are surrounded by. Be friends, right? It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. But as far as ideologies, we don't get rid of the Torah ideologies. And any time the, the Torah ideology is, is, uh, is, at, is at a threat, any time that the, the, the Jews and the nations of the world are mingling too much together, that there's beginning to be an influence away from the Torah, then the, the, this uh, spiritual principle of anti-Semitism sort of comes up as a embedded means of preserving the distinction between the Jewish worldview, or the Jewish lifestyle, the Torah lifestyle, and that of the nations of the world. So... This is something that um, that uh, we, we have to we have to sort of realize that it is a spiritual it is a spiritual principle it is it is a natural sort of uh, preservation um, that there there have been many as as well aside from this sort of uh, spiritual principle that is anti-Semitism this sort of 
a natural spiritual uh, preservation of our identity as Jews, uh, we will we'll, we're going to examine as well um, the, the the teachings of others. Others taught. We said that we, there are some groups that wanted to change the Jews. Others thought that by changing the nations of the world, that anti-Semitism would end. And so, at the beginning of the 19th century, when Western civilized world was was developing in a direction that seemed like it would eventually lead to the equal treatment of all people, of all citizens, many Jews were hopeful that anti-Semitism would kind of go away, would become a relic of the past. And so, solutions that secured popular following included liberalism, socialism, communism, and all sorts of various other isms. All, all, all all came out uh, in the in the late 1900s. This, this was a not not some some even before. The, the, and the idea was that with, with with the growth of these particular worldviews, that there would be uh, the eradication of anti-Semitism. Right, the Jews are now we're not confined to the ghettos anymore. We're allowed to be free citizens now, and so uh, humanism and all of these isms that sought to. Uh, be a, a salvation of sorts, a political salvation of sorts. Uh, all, it, it, all, it, all they were were oftentimes a guise for an opposition against traditional religion. And so many people, uh, many, many in the Jewish community as well, sort of adapted these foreign ideologies as like that. This is going to be the savior. Of, of all mankind, this ideology, this new thing that we came up with, this is it. This is what's going to make a, a utopia. This is what's going to make perfection in the world. And somewhere among all of the various isms, um, that there, there seemed to lie a, a key to equality for all people. Right, and it sounds good on paper. And this is why many Jews supported these types of movements, especially communism. And they believed that, that any movement that professed equality between people would be a benefit for the Jewish people. Needless to say, these were all kind of pipe dreams. Anti-Semitism is unfortunately still alive and well. The anti-Semitic persecutions that sprung up in the aftermath of these movements was in some ways even worse than before. And so the mistakes that these people made is that they didn't consider the fact that the the Jewish people are a nation apart. They, they, the, the tools and the, the rules that are meant, that are used to assess the Jewish nation are different than using other rubrics of other inter, inter, uh, in, hate between groups. And so they, they, they didn't consider that the, that they, from the Torah perspective, that the, the Jews are a nation apart, a different type of relationship, a different purpose, mission in the world. And that that uh, we have a completely different operating system. They, they mistook Am Yisrael. They mistook the the nation and applied the rules of politics to them, and they came up with the wrong answer. The the Chafetz Chaim used to say that every person has the ability to ask Hashem, ask God for advice. Right? Our tradition teaches in the Gemara and Tainus that. That there's nothing that's not hinted at in the Torah. Everything is hinted at in the Torah. And so the solution that one finds when using the Torah as sort of your night vision goggles, that's Hashem's advice. That's God's advice to you. Now, certainly, it contains clear instructions to Klal Yisrael, to the Jewish nation as a whole, including how to manage the relationship with nations that are oppressing you, nations that are out uh, to, to harm you. And so the Torah explains um, what anti-Semitism is and how to prevent it. The Torah also provides us with the instructions for responding to anti-Semitism once it flares up. So what is the Torah's view of anti-Semitism? So Mount Sinai in Hebrew is called Har Sinai, Mount Sinai Har Sinai. And the Torah tells us why is it called Har Sinai. Torah tradition teaches, this is the Gemara, the, the Talmud, the Gemara in Shabbos, says it's called Har Sinai because at that moment when the Jews accepted the Torah on it, it created Sina. It created animosity that 
that uh, came upon the nations of the world, embedded in the spiritual fabric of creation, is a certain degree of, of animosity because the Jews had accepted the Torah and others had not. There's, there's different explanations and commentaries, uh, but for our purposes, Rabbeinu Bachia uh, says, uh, among others, uh, it, it's because of the Torah, it's because God gave the Torah to our nation that there is a, a spiritual, uh, not, a good, not, not in a good spiritual way, but a spiritual undergirding of envy. And because of their envy, they hate us. Again, this is obviously not talking about all the non-Jewish nations and every person in, in, in any particular nation. This is not... This is not what we're talking about over here, but a blatant inner hatred for this concept of a Jew. If that if you find that it exists in a person, this is the spiritual source of it. And the Rambam too, the, the famed medieval sage Maimonides, writes in, in his uh, Igeris Taman, he says, because Hashem, because God has singled us out with his laws and with his statutes, uh, and... Uh, uh, therefore, other nations of the world envied our religion, and their kings committed themselves to persecute us uh, with injustice and hostility. And their desire was to wage war against Hashem and to oppose Him. Again, this is not talking about every single person, but when anti-Semitism comes up, this is its spiritual root. Anti-Semitism is due to jealousy, that anti-Semites have, even even beyond what, even uh, something that they don't even, they can't even realize, they don't even understand that this is where it's coming from. If, a, if an anti-Semite went to a psychologist and, and explored different aspects of his personality, assuming there was nothing that an actual Jew did to him and he holds it against all the Jews, but just on a, on a, on a regular, on a regular uh, basis, where does this where does this animosity come from, right? And so he may not even be aware of where it comes from. Again, we, we, we discussed earlier in today's lesson that there's nothing that you can point to uh, as being a Jew, right? With all the various examples of what constitutes or what all, all share the title Jew, but are completely differently dressed, com have a completely different look, have oftentimes a completely different worldview, but yet this concept of uh, the Jew is still very present and very hated amongst the anti-Semite. So anti-Semitism, the spiritual root of it, is due to the jealousy that the anti-Semites have because we possess the Torah and the benefits that the Torah bestows upon us. And so this, despite the fact that the anti-Semites were offered the Torah and refused it, right? Still on a spiritual, on a spiritual level, they recognized that they were offered it. God offered the Torah to all of the nations of the world, and they refused it, and that, that any member of the nations who desires can obtain the Torah and can live by the Torah. That, that's, that, that is the truth, but despite all that, despite all that, the hatred still exists. Sometimes, sometimes we're more jealous of something that we know that we could have had uh, than, some t than what we are, that, that's completely removed from us. And so sometimes that adds to the jealousy, the fact that I could have said yes to the receiving of the Torah. Or it's something that today I could wake up and decide that I want to have a connection with the Torah, and you choose not to. That sometimes brings more ire. That sometimes brings more hatred because it's something that is in the possibility and you kick yourself harder because it's something that actually you could do. And so because anti-Semitism is an animosity that stems from jealousy, it behooves us to downplay any advantage and any success that we might have. If, if, someone, if someone was jealous of us in general, we would likely choose to be extra polite to them. Right to assuage any sort of hostility that that person might harbor for us, we we would we wouldn't want to act in an arrogant way or flaunt our success in their face. We'd want to just kind of like lay low and just you know do do what you got to do, not 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 flare up all sorts of excitement that that we are the Jews, hear us roar, we are the best. You know, like that that's not that's that's not beneficial to anybody, and frankly, that's often not true. 
And so the safest place for the Jews in Dulles, in exile, is under the radar. Just not, not just kind of like lay low, do your thing, do what we're supposed to do, right? Remain inconspicuous, and that's that. That's it. Hashem created different threats, different types of threats that would require different types of reactions. And so when someone, so in general, like the way that Hashem created the world, the way God created the world is that certain threats uh, should be approached and, and dealt with in different ways. So when someone's attacked by a shark, the best thing that they're supposed to do is whack it on the nose as, as many times as you can. But if the same person is attacked by a grizzly bear, the reaction is supposed to, you're supposed to play dead. Right? Just lie on, lie on the, lie down and play dead. So it's the same, it's the same type of opposition in theory, right? It's, it's two forces coming at you, but they have two completely different ways in which they are meant to be uh, reacted to. And so, uh, when we, we our, our our goal, our job is not to is not to fight back and to is not to be uh, in your face and not not to be a, be inconspicuous, right? We do our thing, we learn our Torah, we do our mitzvahs, we do we we engage in the world, we we uh, we do what we're supposed to do, but we don't have to make a big thing out of it. There are two ways that you that you can deal with a disease, right? You can cure it, or if the disease can't be cured, if anti-Semitism can't be cured, it can at least be managed. There are sometimes at least even if even if somebody is diagnosed with a disease that can't be that can't be uh, cured, there are ways in which you can manage the pain and manage the the manifestation of the disease. So managing an incurable disease means that you live with the disease, but you administer treatment that would prevent its symptoms from harming and from disturbing the, 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 the patient. Right? Anti-Semitism is an incurable disease. We are not going to come up with an ideology that is going to, we're not going to come up with another ism. Right? Before it was socialism, communism, humanism, all the other isms. We're not going to come up with an ism that is going to get rid of anti-Semitism. What we need to do, what we need to do is just do our thing, lay low, not cause any, not cause any sort of scene. And again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm also not saying that any time anti-Semitism has come up is because all of the Jews at that time or that place or whatever were guilty of doing such a thing. But the best way to, to deal with an anti-Semitic aggressor is 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 to is to just sort of lay low, not flaunt yourself, not uh, not um, not let the ire swell up uh, even more, right? So, uh, if, if imagine that you have a sheep that's sort of surrounded by wolves, so that the more inconspicuous, the more more uh, harmless and, and unthreatening, and you know, kind of on the wayside that the sheep can look, the the less the wolves are going to. Want, you know, want to want to eat it. The less the wolves will notice the sheep, the better. You know, um, and so if you look at the Jewish people, if you look at this this Torah nation, as as if we as if we were one of the nations of the world, our survival is inexplicable. But if you look at the Jewish nation as a custom-made metaphysical nation that was set apart by God, chosen for a specific mission, then it becomes that our, our unique nature, um, our, our, our reason for survival becomes readily apparent. There is a purpose for the nation to exist that, that that purpose has not yet been achieved. The nation was promised to be an eternal nation. It makes perfect sense that the nation is here. And so one of the things that are that are important, and based on our discussion, I'm gonna kind of tie it up. We can go on about this really for hours. I mean, there's there is so much to, to talk about in this. Maybe we'll do a sequel uh, in the in the near future. But here here are some of the points that we can take out of this and how to um, how to promote, how to, uh, again, uh, get rid of it, not get rid of anti-Semitism, manage anti-Semitism, and uh, eradicate it uh, on, a, on a global scale from a Torah perspective. And they both are centered in Torah. Again, anti-Semitism, as we learned, that Hashem makes a separation between day and night, between the Jewish nation and the nations of the world, and that means that God does not want our Torah worldview and our Torah observance 
to be usurped by secular culture, the culture of the nations around us. As long as we are preserving our Torah tradition, that actually helps that anti-Semitism doesn't quell up. Again, yeah, it's not necessarily a direct cause and effect. This is all sort of spiritual underlay that, that exists in the world. But the more we are, are march proud as Jews, not as, look at that, that Jew who's, who's the biggest doctor and the Nobel Prize winner and the sports star and the, whatever it is, but look at that Jew who exemplifies Torah and Torah values and what the Torah it means for the world, that actually attracts the nations of the world. That actually is something that is seen in a good light. It's kind of like how when, it, when a Jewish person, unfortunately, publicly does something wrong, they're busted for some big thing, especially if they look like a Jew and act like a Jew and you were know, you know, religious or had the trimmings of a religious person, it's always seen as like a bigger deal. It's, and uh, it's, oh, look, look what the Jew did. Right? Uh, but when a Jew is doing what they're supposed to do, and we're acting in accordance with the Torah, and when we're acting as, uh, as, the, as a light unto the nations, then anti-Semitism actually does, uh, is, is lessened. The re respect that others will have for us just naturally will come out uh, from that type of example. In fact, when we, on a, on a global scale, are acting in the, in the realm of Torah, when we're encouraging others to act in the realm of Torah as well, we create a peaceful and good environment, which the world was planned to be anyway. If a person really wants to uh, act, be active in quelling anti-Semitism, in eradicating darkness and dark ideas from the world, the greatest way that you can do that is by adding in light. And what that means specifically is getting more in sync with the Torah worldview. The Torah worldview is the light that has been given to the world. It has been given to the Jewish nation to be a light unto the nation. We're all here to work together to make this place into a radiating divine dwelling place. And if we do our part in the divine mission that God set forth, there is no room for the darkness. If the world is so consumed with light, there's no room for darkness. The greatest way that we confront anti-Semitism is not by making, uh, by, by making protests and surveys and, and, and uh, lawsuits. And, uh, this, this sometimes only adds, uh, adds to the mess. The greatest thing that we can do is strengthened in our divine light that was bestowed upon us. And that is our adherence to the Torah. The more mitzvahs that we do, the more commandments that we do, the more Torah that we learn, the more we pray, the more we're involved in what the Torah deems a priority and deems the purpose for the world, the light shines and darkness goes away. So I, I hope that this is something that's helpful, that's useful, on a practical scale, I hope that you and your individual life uh, will be an example. Whatever your background is, if you're of the Jewish faith, be proud of your, of your Torah adherence. Be proud of the traditions. Be proud of the commandments, the light that you were given uh, that began all the way back by our forefather Abraham, that you've inherited, that you've gained. Uh, and if you're of the nations of the world, be an example in your own life. Uh, follow the, the ethical premises, the ethical commandments uh, set forth in the Torah. Inspire your neighbors to do the same. Encourage them to, to be, become a part, not of the Jewish nation, but a part of the Torah mentality, the Torah world mentality. And this, by adding in this light, this is how we eradicate not only the darkness of anti-Semitism, not only the darkness of all evil whatsoever, we eradicate all death and destruction, and ultimately this will come to fruition very soon with the coming of Mashiach, when the whole light, the whole world will shine in a glorious way, filled with the radiance of God for all nations to see and participate in. May we have it very soon right now. Have a wonderful day, and I look forward to speaking with all of you soon. How did Noah protect himself from the tumultuous flood? by coming into the ark. In Hebrew, the word teva means both ark and word. 
And by you and I delving into the words of Torah, we too are saved and protected from the tumultuous and catastrophic events that happen throughout our lives. The ARC Online Learning Program is your opportunity, no matter what your religious background is, to delve into Torah in a thorough and clear way with a rabbi. Now, you don't have a lot of time. You're dealing with work, you're dealing with the kids, you're dealing with all sorts of stuff. That's why we've condensed every day's lesson into 15 minutes. Plus, you'll have access to all the back archives and access to the rabbi. So anytime you can learn at your own pace and whatever time you choose. I hope that you'll sign up for the ARC today. If you have any questions about it, just comment below. Otherwise, I look forward to seeing all of you on board the ARC today.